Everything was quiet on that summer evening in 1943. After dark, of course, there would be a few clashes with patrols, but nothing more, that's war. Some of us were rounded up to distribute supper, which uh, we ate late. We were forbidden to touch the few cans we had, for they constituted our total reserve. Dusk was falling when the Feld, responsible for our section, waved us over to him. We were listening intently as he told us what what we would be expected to do. He had a large map of the district in which he showed uh, us the points we should attain, taking every precaution. When the order was given, we should be prepared to protect the infantry, who would quickly join and then pass us. We were given a list of rallying points and other details which I only partly understood and advised to rest, as we would not be called before the middle of the night. We stood and stared at each other for a long time. Now we knew we were going to be part of a full-scale attack. A heavy sense of foreboding settled over us, and the knowledge that soon some of us would be dead was stamped on every face. Even a victorious army suffers dead and wounded. The Fuhrer himself had said it. In fact, none of us could imagine his own death. Some would be killed. We all knew that, but each one imagined himself doing the burying. No one, despite the obvious danger, could think of himself lying mortally wounded. That was something which happened to other people, thousands of them, and never do oneself. Everyone clung to this idea, despite fear and doubt. Even the Hitler Hugen, who spent years cultivating the idea of sacrifice, couldn't consciously envision their own ends occurring within a few hours. One might be exalted by a grand idea based on a structure of logic and even be prepared to run large risks, but to believe in the worst is impossible. Finally night came, a soft summer night, which brought with it a brush of freshness after the torrid day. Everywhere free of the war, people must have been stretched out in the grass beside their houses, enjoying the season with their friends. Sometimes when I was small, I used to take a walk with my parents before going to bed. My father believed one should enjoy these summer evenings to the maximum and keep me out of my eyelids, droop me sleep. Hals pulled me back from my thoughts. My dear Sager, be sure to look out for yourself when we get going. It would be too stupid to get killed just before the war's over. Yes, I said, that would be stupid. All of us were haunted by so many thoughts. The conversation was impossible. Each of us was obsessed by that particular question. How shall I come through this time? In the depths of the covered shelter, one of the Hugenloen was playing quietly on a harmonica. The voices of his companion joined softly in the melody. And the sound of gunfire made us jump. Here we go, we thought. But everything quieted down again. Lenson came up to us. The first Soviet line is less than 400 yards from here, he said. The field, the felt just told me. That's really not very far. That's not too bad either, said the veteran of a little while ago. At least we can sleep in peace. At Smolensk, the Pospol's holes were less than a grenade's throw from ours. No one answered him. I'm commanding Group 6, said Lenson, and I have to get right under Ivan's nose to keep him from moving when the assault troops begin their attack. You can imagine. We'll have it about the same time, said the sergeant who would lead us. According to what I've read, we'll be right in line with one of their positions. We listened attentively, hoping that our part in the enterprise was not going to be too dangerous. But the scout, the Russian scouts are sure to see us, said Lindbergh, horrified. That's crazy. That will be the hardest part, but let's hope the night is dark. Also, we've been advised not to fire before the attack, to get into position without noise. Don't forget mines, said the veteran, who in fact had not gone to sleep. The, the ground was checked for mine by details from the disciplinary battalion insofar as possible. Insofar as possible, sneered the veteran. I like that. All the same, you better be careful. If you see any wires, don't go tugging them. If you keep on like this, 
Lenson shouted in a threatening voice. I'll put you to sleep until the attack. He shook his stubby finger fist under the old man's nose. The veteran only smiled, but didn't say anything. What if we run right into Ivan? Asked Grenadier Krauss. Then we'll have to use our guns, won't we? Only as a last resort. In principle, we're supposed to take them by surprise, knock them out without any noise. Without any noise? What do you mean? With, with the butts of our guns or spades? Spades, bayonets, anything. But we gotta get rid of them, that's all. And w without raising the alarm. We'll take them prisoner, murmured young Lindbergh. Are you off your rocker? said the non-com. An assault group can't take prisoners during a mission. What would we, what would we do with them? Hell, said Howells. You mean we'll have to skewer them? Lost your guts? Asked Lenson. Hell no, said Howells, to show that he was a man, but his face was white. I glanced at the spade pick hooked to my big friend's waist. They had to stand up so a helpsman and his group could get through. Where are we exactly? Young Lindbergh asked naively. In Russia, said the veteran. No one smiled at this feeble joke, and the non-com tried to give us a rush idea of our position. Some three miles northwest of Belgorod. I'm going to try and sleep, stammered Howells, who was clearly shaken by all these preparations. We laid down side by side without bothering to undo our bedrolls. The steel of the spandau, which Howells had set up pointing down the length of the trench, gleamed with a dull luster. Sleep was impossible, not because of the discomfort of a night outdoors strapped into all our gear. We'd done that often before, because of our anxiety about what lay ahead. Hell, I've got plenty of time to sleep when I'm dead. Grenadier Krauss said in a loud voice. He stood up and pissed against the wall of the trench. I lay awake for a long time, thinking and thinking. Finally, I did sleep for about three hours until I was wakened by the distant sound of a motor. My movement woke Howells and Grumpers, the other grenadier, who's lying beside me with head on my shoulder. What, what's the matter? He groaned sleepily. I don't know. I... I thought maybe they'd call us. What time is it? I looked at my school watch. 2.20. What time is dawn? Asked young Lindbergh, who hadn't been able to sleep at all. Probably very early this time of year. The sound of engines continued. Those fucking drivers. Keep it up. They'll wake every one of the goddamn Ruskies. We tried to go back to sleep, but couldn't. But half an hour later, we heard a muted noise of bustle and commotion just beyond the walls of the covered shelter. In the darkness, we guessed that we were listening to some fellows collecting their gear. We all turned toward the sound, trying to grasp what was happening, when a felt appeared wearing camouflage. Groups 8 and 9, he said in a low voice. Present. You'll be leaving in five minutes. By, act, by way of access C, and will proceed to your respective positions. Good luck. He pointed to a small sign, scarcely visible in the darkness, marked with the letter C. All our reflections came to a dead stop and our brains emptied as if we'd been anesthetized. Everyone grabbed his gun and checked the critical points of his harness and straps, as Hauptmann Fink had taught us, especially the chin straps of our helmet. Halls lifted the big FM onto his shoulders, and Lindbergh, who was his number two man, slipped his slender silhouette in beside the man he was supposed to serve. Only the veteran, our second machine gunner, behaved, behaved as if he'd forgotten the object of all these preparations. His movements were not marked by the febrile haste which characterized the actions of the rest of us. He, all, he knew all this from before. He propped the heavy FM against his leg and waited for the order to move out. I hope you're in good shape, he said to the gun, grinning sardonically. Group 8, called the sergeant, sounding as if he'd been struck by a sudden electric shock. After me and silence. We took exit C and, sticking close together, followed the trench to the forward positions. Our non-com was at the head of the column. Behind him came Grumpers, the Grenadier, who was about 22 years old, then Hals, just past 18, and Lindbergh, not quite 17, then our three gunners, a Czech of indefinable age with an unpronounceable name, 
a Sudeten of 19 whose name ended with an A and me, and then me. Right beside me was the veteran with his number two man, another terrified boy, and finally Grenadier Krauss, who must have been well into his 20s. We moved out in good order, exactly as we'd been taught in Camp F, where we'd sweated so hard. Indefinable noises reached us, coming from either the Russian or German lines. We crossed several trenches jammed with troops who were still half asleep in the warm summer air before climbing out of our own trench in the middle of the woods. Young Lindbergh, who was loaded down like a donkey, slipped on the earth embankment, and the magazines of his Spandau he was carrying clashed together. The non-com grabbed him by his straps and helped him climb up. Then he glared at him furiously and kicked him in the shin. We walked to the edge of the wood in single file. The non-com stopped short very suddenly, and we all more or less piled into each other. It's darker than Hades in here, the veteran muttered in my ear. It seemed to me that our guide, having signed us to stop, was now going on ahead. We just, we stayed where we were, bent double, waiting for an order to proceed. Despite our best efforts to keep quiet, we couldn't avoid a certain amount of metallic clatter from all the weapons we were carrying. The non-com came back, and we set out again, walking forward another short distance to the foxholes at the edge of the wood, where our scouts were waiting as quiet as snakes. We threw ourselves down into their short trench. As flat as you can, whispered the Sudeten, who in principle walked just ahead of me. Pass it on. One by one, we left the last German positions and crawled out into the warm earth of no man's land. I kept my eyes glued to the hobnailed soles of the Sudetans' boots, trying nervously to keep in sight all that could be seen of my closest companion. From time to time, the air ahead of me would darken with the looming shape of a comrade who had to climb over some obstacle. At other moments, the soles of the boots ahead of me would suddenly stop inches from the end of my nose. Then I would be gripped by a horrible anxiety. Maybe the Sudeten had lost sight of the fellow in front of him. A moment later, we would begin to move again, and the instinctive confidence I felt as part of the group would unknot my throat. During such moments, even naturally reflective characters suddenly feel their heads emptying, and nothing seems to matter except the dry, cracking stick pressing into one's stomach which one must somehow crush and pass over without making any noise. A new hitherto unsuspected acuteness sharpens every sense. And the tension seems pressing, enough to subdue one's wildly racing heart. We inch slowly forward across the damnable Russian soil, which all of us had already trampled more than enough, we had to crawl around a short stretch of light sand against which we would show up too easily, crushing under our bodies a mat of thorny creepers which we took at first for Russian barbed wire. Then we came to a mossy hollow where we stopped for a moment. Our sergeant, who had a very good sense of direction, was going over our route in his head trying to fix our position. The hollow reeked with a pestilential smell. When we began to move again, I was startled to see mo two motionless figures lying in the sand two yards to our right. I pointed at them, nudging the veteran, who looked and grabbed his nose. With a shock of horror, I understood that we had just passed two corpses, which were quietly rotting as they waited for burial in a common grave. We seemed to have crawled as far as China... About half an hour after we started, we came to the first Russian wire. We waited with beating hearts while our first men opened a precarious passage. Every time we heard the cutter snapped, we expected to see a spray of dirt shooting up from an exploding mine. Our faces, blackened with soot from the canteen kettles, were pouring with sweat, and the tension was so great we certainly must have aged several years during the few minutes we needed to crawl under the Soviet wire at a speed about 15 yards an hour. When we had all made it through, we stopped for several moments and huddled together. 
Every one of us was trembling. We could hear faint sounds from the Russian forward positions. We rolled our eyes at each other and understood without words that we all felt the same way. We crept forward another 20 yards to a stand of low scrub or tall grass. We could hear the sound of voices and knew beyond a doubt we had reached the first Russian line. Suddenly, we were staring incredulously at an almost invisible figure. A Soviet reconnaissance man who was bending over a hole which undoubtedly contained some of his comrades. We almost stopped breathing and slowly lifted our guns looking at our leader who seemed to have frozen and then at each other with a look beyond expression as the Russian walked slowly toward us. Then he turned back. Our sergeant pulled a knife from his belt. Its blade flashed white for a moment before he thrust it into the ground in front of the grumpers, pointing to the Russian with one finger. The grenadier opened his eyes immediately wide and looked with horror from the Russian to the knife to the sergeant. The latter gestured him on as Grumper's quivering hand clenched round the knife handle. With a final mute look of supplication, the grenadier began to creep forward. We followed the progress of his dark shape with an anxiety which made us clench our teeth to keep from crying out. Then he was lost in the darkness. The Russian was still talking to his friends as if the war were a thousand miles away. He took a few more steps, we could hear more voices a little far off. For long moments, each of us forgot our own existence. The Russian walked toward the spot where Grumpers must have hidden and turned back. As he turned, a second silhouette rose up behind him. Grumpers covered the four or five yards that separated him from his quarry in one jump. The Russian whirled around. We heard a rough cry and the sound of a struggle. From a hole a short way off, we heard Russian voices. Then we were able to distinguish the silhouette of our grenadier rolling on the ground and heard the sound of his voice. Halfi Kamaradin. The Russian jumped to one side and the sound of his machine gun tore into the quiet of the night as if white flashes striped the darkness. To my left, another machine gun opened up and its bullets followed the howling Russian as far as the earth embankment in front of the foxhole into which he had plunged. From the hole, we could hear voices shouting, Jermansky, Jermansky! With a leap which looked like it was beyond his capacities, the veteran propelled himself forward, hurling a grenade from his right fist. The object vanished into the darkness for two or three seconds, then the hole was lit by a brilliant white light, and we heard the outcry of several voices before a moment of silence. We withdrew as fast as we could, keeping parallel to the barbed wire. Behind us, we could hear a rising tumult. Risking mines and bullets, we ran for a small hillock, and gasping for breath, hazily attempted to organize a defensible position in the thicket. Idiots! The sergeant exploded, meaning Krauss and the veteran. I didn't give an order to fire. We'll never get out of this now. He was scared as anybody else. But Grumpers asked for help, Sergeant. He was in bad trouble. An instant later, a dozen flares lit our surroundings as brightly as day. And a Russian fuselage shook the air all around us. The Russians were also heaving grenades at random, the way we would have done. We're finished, whimpered young Lindbergh. Quick, a shovel got to dig in or they'll slaughter us. Nobody moved. The veteran commanded authoritatively on our terror. We obeyed him. His voice sounded more confident than the sergeant's. We tried to freeze absolutely, even down to the fluttering of our eyelids. A flare burst in a brilliant white light directly over us, and anyone whose face wasn't buried in the ground could see every detail of our circumstances. Just beyond us lay the body of Grumpers and the Russian and five or six foxholes 
proceeding a V-shaped infantry position. Other flares lit the edge of the wood from which our adventures had begun. Luckily, the Russians nearest us hadn't noticed the rise of ground, which was giving us cover. However, their soldiers in the more distant positions, which we had seen in the light of the flares, could see us. They began throwing grenades too, and they were using, and they were using the superb Russian grenade throwers. God, if they've got those goddamn things, we've had it. We ought to dig, sniveled Lindbergh. Shut up. Dig with your belly if you like, but don't move any, but don't move anything else. If we play dead, maybe they'll think we are. Something fell with a dull thud on the other side of the hill, like its crust disintegrated, and we were splattered by a rain of earth. There were no new flares coming over, and the ones still falling were fading. As usual, the Russians were shouting curses at us. Another grenade landed somewhere to our left, and we could hear the whistling fall of its fragments through the noise of the explosion. Someone lying beside the veteran groaned. Shut up! Hold it back! muttered the veteran between clenched teeth. If they hear anything, that's it. He was talking to his number two man. The boy was clawing at his face, which was twisted with pain. His hands were trembling. Don't make a sound! put his hand on the boy's forearms. Be strong. Grenades were still falling all around us. The boy clenched his fists and his eyes flooded with tears. Quiet! The flares died out and everything around us became pitch black. The Russians must have spotted another group of our men somewhat to the north of us. It was their turn to get the lights and the noise. Then we heard other sounds directly ahead of us. By deliberately dilating our pupils as wide as we could, we were able to distinguish several men creeping forward parallel to our position. A cold sweat trickled down our backs. The veteran was holding a large grenade about four inches from my nose. Once again, we froze. The hunched figures came toward us as far as the barbed wire, then turned back. We all breathed again. The wounded boy buried his face in the ground and tried to stifle his groans. They're just as scared as we are, said the veteran. Somebody orders them up here to see what's going on. So they take a few steps and then run back as fast as they can and say they didn't see anything. It's almost dawn, whispered our non cop I, I think we could stay here. It seems a pretty good spot. I don't, Sergeant. I think we should get out. Maybe you're right, you... He said, pointing to the house. There's a hole about 20 yards from here, level with barbed wire. You get over there. Hals and Lindbergh slid off like snakes. Where are you hurt? The veteran asked the wounded boy, touching him on the shoulder. The young man lifted his face, which was smeared with dirt and tears. I can't move. Something hurts here. He touched his hip. A splinter. Don't move. We'll send someone to help you. Yes, said the boy, thrusting his face back into the dirt. Our assault troops should be here in 10 or 15 minutes. If everything goes well, soon the sun would be up. We waited feverishly. Isn't there going to be a bombardment first, asked Kraus. Lucky there's not, said the veteran. We'd get it just as bad as the pop-offs. There won't be, said the sergeant. The first waves are supposed to take the enemy by surprise. We're here to neutralize the enemy's defenses. But our fellows might mistake us for Russians and do us in. Exactly, said the veteran, laughing. Russian voices came to us in bursts, as clearly as if they were in the trench with us. At least they don't seem worried. What's the use of worrying? We'd all be dead in an hour anyway, said the veteran, as if he were thinking aloud. The light was increasing rapidly. Everything was still great, but we could distinguish a portion of the Russian V position in line with the veteran Spandau, it lowered down to the left. A motionless gray mass, Hals, Lindbergh, and FM. You, young fellow, said the veteran, looking at me, you'll replace my number two man. Get over here on my left. Right, I said, worming my way toward him. A minute later, my nose was pressed against the metal of the FM's magazine. 
we could see most of the details of the Russian position a hundred yards ahead of us. From our hillock overlooking the enemy, we glimpsed momentary snatches of pale faces, like faces in a dream. It now seems to me astonishing that the Russians hadn't occupied our little hill. However, there were similar rises to the ground all around us, and they couldn't have occupied all of it. We were staring straight ahead when our leader's hand pointed to our left rear. Look, he said in almost full voice. We carefully turned our heads the way he was pointing and saw the bodies of many men slithering along the ground, breaking through the network of Russian protection. As far as we could see, the ground was covered with creeping figures. They're ours, said the veteran, and a faint smile crossed his face. Get ready to fire if anyone moves in Ivan's hole, our leader added.